Hello, Alex here, and today we're going to talk about what might as well be the only fixer that exists in a lot of people's minds, Ilford Rapid Fixer, and what you need to know about it in terms of safety, handling, and disposal. This video was kindly sponsored by the folks at thephotoshop.ie, who have partnered with me on this educational video series about photographic chemical safety. More about them later, but for now, let's get into it. Obviously, before we really get into it, I need to give my mandatory legal disclaimer. The opinions expressed within this video are my own opinions and do not constitute legal advice or recommendations on my own behalf or the behalf of the Photoshop.ie or its staff. If you have any serious concerns, consult your local regulatory agency, so your council, city or other board, but I will be happy to answer more generic questions in the comments down below, by Instagram DMs or by email. Over the course of this video, we will rank uh, Ilford Rapid Fixer out of three within the context of safety, handling, disposal, and also cost. Cost especially for this one. And then we'll tally up those scores at the end of the video and see how it compares to everything else. For the sake of brevity, whenever I say silver halides, I'm specifically talking about whatever mixture of silver bromide, silver iodide, and rarely silver chloride that is present in your film emulsion. Saying silver halide as a discrete thing makes about as much sense as saying dip or sauce. It's a class rather than a specific thing, and that's just something that it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine. But when I say silver halide, I'm just trying to not repeat the entire phrase of the relevant mixture of sodium bromide, sodium iodide, and rarely sodium chloride in the appropriate mixture in your film emulsion every single time. Following the development stage of your actual film development, your final image is present within the emulsion as a metallic silver crystal or a conglomerate of silver crystal grains. However, the unexposed silver halide that was not exposed to light during your exposure, and hopefully not during development, if, unless you screw things up, is still there and it has to be removed because at this point the emulsion is still sensitive to light and exposing that excess silver halide to light will either cause fogging of your image in small doses of light or can cause solarization in extreme cases. That's its own thing and it might be what you're looking for sometimes, but 99% of the time it's not what you're going for when you're developing film. So we do need to remove that excess silver halide from the emulsion to stabilize or fix the final image. Fixer fixes the final image by stripping those unreacted silver halides out of the emulsion into the fixer itself. It does this by one of two different chemical reactions and which one, I mean, they both happen. It doesn't matter that there are two, just that you know that it's an overall process where the thiol sulfate active ingredient within the fixer extracts the silver out and into itself. Therefore, the silver halide is no longer in the film, and even though it's still sensitive to light, somewhat, it will no longer affect the quality of your images. Here are the two chemical processes that represent this actual fixing process. Uh, in each case, the X is just a generic symbol for a halide in chemistry. That could represent fluoride, chloride, bromide, or iodide. We don't use silver fluoride in film. Silver chloride is very rare, but regardless, the X is a generic thing. Thiosulfate and silver bond together very strongly, which is why the thiosulfate is able to pull the silver ions out of the emulsion. This process is chemically selective or chemoselective, as the thiosulfate ion is negatively charged, the silver ion in the silver halide is positively charged, and your grown developed silver crystal grains are metallic silver with no charge and there is no attraction to the thiosulfate ion. This is why Fixer does not strip your image out of the film and only strips out the excess unreacted silver halide. If you want to get technical, silver ions, silver plus one ions, and the thiosulfate ion are both soft in terms of Lewis acidity and Lewis basicity, which makes silver one a potent thiophile and it bonds very strongly to the thiosulfate. With regards to the actual chemical composition, I'm going to breeze through this because I'm going to be talking about each of these components a little bit more later and I don't want this particular section to drag on too long. There are three things apart from water within the Ilford Rapid Fixer concentrate. The first is the ammonium thiosulfate, which is the active fixing agent present in about 36 to 50% concentration. As always, presumably weight per volume if not specified. The second ingredient is the sodium bisulfite, which acts as a preservative, which I'll talk about more in a moment. 
and that's present at about a 1-5% to concentration. The third and final ingredient is the acetic acid, which is just a source of a weak acid, which is necessary as I'll come to in a moment. It is the ammonium thiosulfate specifically that makes Ilford Rapid Fixer a rapid fixer compared to older fixers, be they concentrated gels or powders, that would require much longer fixing times. I don't know, I don't have any, probably on the order of 5 to 20 minutes versus like one minute for paper to two to five minutes for film with Ilford Rapid Fixer. That's a huge practical difference and it's worth it even though the ammonium thiosulfate is a little bit more expensive. Ilford Rapid Fixer is sold as a concentrate and it's intended to be diluted down to either a 1 plus 4 or a 1 plus 9 working solution giving 5 or 10 litres capacity out of a single 1 litre bottle respectively. The concentrate comes in at about pH 5 and the working solutions will work out at somewhere in the region of pH 5.5 and 6 respectively once diluted down to the actual stock working concentration. This is important because Fixer should be mildly acidic not over the top, but just a little bit. I mentioned in my previous video on stop baths that this is one of the things that stop baths is good for. It prevents the basic developer. I know not all developers are basic, but very few of us are using metal or metal. It prevents that basic developer being carried over into the fixer and increasing the pH of your working solution of fixer, which will prevent it from working for as long. The reason for this is that the sodium bisulfite preservative the HSO3- ion is only an effective preservative as the HSO3 bisulfate ion and not the SO3-2- sulfite ion which is formed at higher pHs. Bisulfite ion specifically preferentially reacts with oxygen so it is destroyed instead of your thiosulfate sulfate ion which is the active fixing ingredient remember so that the fixing process can continue on longer. You can get more out of your fixer as long as the thiosulfate is still there and use the absolute bejesus out of it because it's a pain to dispose of as we'll get to. So anything that helps you use every last molecule of thiosulfate is worthwhile. Here's the chemical equation showing the reaction of the bisulfite ion with oxygen gas yielding both sulfate and a bit of acid. In terms of capacity, Ilford say that 1 litre of 1 plus 4 working solution will fix about 24 rolls of film, which means that the 1 plus 9 solution that I use, for laziness reasons, could do about half that, about 12 rolls. I think the most I've gotten is 15 before I started getting milky negatives, but even so, that's a little bit more than what they recommend. The official recommendation, remember, has to cater for us as well as like actual labs, so they have to be err on the side of consistency rather than getting the absolute most out of the fixer. According to Ilford themselves, the concentrate will last about two years unopened and stored at cool temperature, but once opened should be used within six months. The bottle that I've been using is about 14 months old, as in I opened it 14 months ago and the working solutions I'm making out of it still work okay. I've had no problem so far, but it's worth knowing that the, the shelf life that they talk about isn't about the absolute ability to fix film. It will still fix film once it's older, but it's about consistency and archival long term. So if you're really concerned about that, I would probably chuck it after about six months. The working solution itself will last about six months, again according to Ilford, in a tightly sealed, full, as in no headspace, no oxygen on top of it, bottle. About one month in a partially filled bottle and about a week in an open container like a tray in a dark room. A common method that's used by a lot of private individuals and some commercial labs to get the most out of the fixer without compromising on long-term archival quality of the negatives is a two-bath process. Ilford have their own method, other people have different methods depending on who you ask online. But the broad idea is that you split your fixing into two fixings and you use either first or second a weaker, nearly exhausted, partially used up fixer Ilford recommend using that for the first wash and then you use fresh fixer for the second wash to really strip out any trace of silver halide and then that will just get you a bit more out of your older fixer and then make sure that the negatives are fully stripped clean for long-term storage. I personally don't do that but a lot of people that I know do such as Brendan from the Photoshop which is how I found out about this. With regards to safety, there's not a lot to say. The concentrate itself has only a warning symbol and mild skin irritation and severe eye irritation. That makes it 
as close to non-hazardous as you can realistically get. It's not as good as Ilfostop or Photoflow or anything like that, but the concentrate is pretty okay and the working solutions that are much weaker, 5x or 10x weaker, are going to be fine as well. When it comes to first aid, like with Ilfostop, it's the boilerplate kind of generic first aid-y stuff. Wash it off, wash people's mouths out, seek medical attention if they're unwell. Nothing really too concerning here. In terms of PPE, I would actually recommend eye protection and gloves of some sort, be they latex or nitrile, just to protect your skin, but not because of the mild acid, not because of the thiol sulfate's chemical activity or anything, just because the bisulfate and the thiol sulfate will leave sulfur residues on surface and they stink and you don't want to get that on your hands and smell like rotten eggs. That's all. With regards to exposure controls, I mean tens of milligrams per cubic meter, that's not going to be a problem. Don't worry about this whatsoever. It doesn't give off a lot of strong vapors that can harm you. So unless you're splashing in it like it's in a pool and deliberately dispersing droplets of fixer into the air, it's not going to be a thing that you need to worry about. And then toxicologically, again, apart from the, the potential risk of irritation to the eyes, there's really nothing to say. None of these components are actually toxic in any way, just irritating at worst. For this reason, I'm gonna give it a two, I would give two and a half, but I'm not gonna break my scores down that granularly, two out of three. There are only minor issues in terms of safety, that being the potential risk of stinking up your hands or your clothes, and that there is a little bit of risk of skin, of eye damage, just where PPE, it's fine, wash your hands. Nothing major, but it's not quite nice enough to give it a three out of three. When it comes to handling and storage, the SDS gives more boilerplate stuff. Store it at reasonable temperatures in a suitable container. Don't spill it everywhere. Don't be stupid with it. That's again, that's fine. That's nothing that you need to be concerned about at all. And then again, stability, I mean, the thiosulfate and bisulfite are reducing agents, so you should keep it away from oxidizers but it's an AP solution and it's not going to be a problem, put it that way. There is a, a small level of risk associated with that, but I would be more concerned about mild oxidants than mild reducing agents in my own home, for reference. Two things that aren't in the SDS though are mixing. It's a very viscous, almost gel-like liquid, not as bad as something like HC110, which we'll talk about in a future video, but it is quite viscous and you do have to mix it pretty thoroughly to get an even homogenous solution of your working fixer. Realistically, this just means pour the fixer, the concentrated fixer into your measuring cylinder first, add the water to it, which will do most of the mixing for you, and then just invert it in your container a couple of times if you're putting it in a sealed bottle or just stir it with a stick or something for like a minute or so. We're not talking about mixing in a blender for 15 to 30 minutes, nothing like that. You just need to put in a small amount of effort to get it thoroughly mixed. The other thing is that as you accumulate silver or silver thiosulfate in your fixer as it is used, you will eventually have to increase your fixing time somewhat. You can go and do leader clearing tests. I don't bother. I just leave everything in my fixer for about five to 10 minutes and that has never failed me until the fixer dies. In a practical sense, within a reasonable time frame, you can't overfix, whereas you could overdevelop. So it's a bit more relaxed in that in that way. I would normally just dump in my fixer in the film, agitate it for the first minute, and go eat dinner or something, or tidy around the house, tidy up the rest of my dev stuff. You don't need to be precise, so long as you're not underfixing. Ilford say two to five minutes for fresh fixer, so five to 10 minutes is probably fine for basically anything. But it is something that you do need to be in mind that if you are trying to get the last out of your fixer and use it like all the way until it no longer can fix, you will have to be a bit more mindful of the time as time goes on. For these reasons, I'm gonna give Ilford Rapid Fixer a two out of three for handling. The mixing thing and the time really just add a small little bit of mental effort and a tiny, tiny amount of physical effort that you have to put in. Like for example, tracking the number of rolls that you fixed with your fixer. Small things that make it not a mindless operation and there's no clear indicator to tell you when the fixer is no longer working, but you get a good enough idea pretty quickly when you see your negatives come out milky. If that happens, you just refix them in the fresh stuff within a minute or two, it's fine. 
disposal. Oh god, okay, this is the big part of the video, and I know this video is already going to be long. So straight up, first off, if you're disposing of unused old fixer, like say your bottle has gone a bit crusty and you don't trust it, that just goes down the sink, wash it down for maybe 5-10 minutes with warm water behind it, that's completely fine. The components in there are non-hazardous. The problem with disposing of used fixer is the silver. Silver is a heavy metal, and that makes used fixer that has silver in it heavy metal waste. It is anything from a minor offence to a severe crime in most countries to pour heavy metal waste down the drain. Not only is it illegal, but silver thiosulfate, which is what forms from the mixture of the thiosulfate and the silver ions leach out of the emulsion, is not just bad for aquatic life acutely and chronically, but it is also corrosive to the metals that make up the pipes in your drainage. Therefore, over time, if you do that a lot, you could corrode away and destroy your pipes. So whether or not you care about the man and the law, you could ruin your own plumbing. So don't pour fixer that has silver in it, as in used fixer, down the drain. Just don't do it. Sections 12 and 13 of the SDS are basically of no help here because the SDS refers to the concentrate as you get it, not what you've not factoring in what you put into it in terms of silver after the fact. It just says what I've already said. The unspent fixer, unused fixer, can just go down the drain. That's not really helpful for what we're talking about here. There are a few different ways that you can desilver or recover the silver from your fixer, either to sell or just to put it in solid waste, which is usually okay. Check your local laws. But if you desilver the fixer, it can go down the drain. There are a bunch of different methods, and this is what I do but I've only done one method and I want to be able to compare a few different methods more thoroughly and not quantitatively, but reasonably qualitatively in the future. So I'm going to cover those in a future video because this video is already going to be far too long as it is. If you don't desilver your fixer, you're probably going to have to pay for your local waste management company, recycling center or whatever to dispose of it for you. In that case, there are two main things that you can do to make that process smoother and hopefully a little bit cheaper. The first is to actually evaporate some of the water off. When it comes to heavy metal waste, it's not just about the amount of heavy metal, it's about the volume of waste that has to physically be dealt with. So if you can put your fixer in an open, properly labeled container in a secure location away from children and pets, all that kind of common sense thing, then you could evaporate it down, reduce the volume, and you will, even though the concentration will increase and the amount of silver hasn't changed, in most situations, you will end up paying a little bit less for that disposal because there's less physical stuff there. You know, if it's a, a five liter bottle instead of a 20 liter drum, that works out cheaper for you most of the time. So it's worth doing. The second is to actually specify what it is and how much of it there is. Ilford say that fixer stops being so good performance wise at about eight to 10 grams per liter of silver thiosulfate. So what I would do is actually label it as an aqueous solution of silver thiosulfate at about an eight to 10 gram per liter concentration. Knowing what's in the waste makes your waste cheaper to get rid of. If you're asked what else is in there, you can pretty confidently say trace miscellaneous byproducts or whatever. There's not really anything else in there and it's not a lie to say that. Anything else in there is gonna be 1% or lower by the time you're disposing of your fixer, assuming you're not putting in dirty developer and that kind of thing. That's not gonna be a problem. But giving your waste management company an unknown bottle of, oh, uh, use fixer, I don't know, stuff, they're gonna charge you out the nose for that. You're gonna pay an absolute fortune. I haven't yet heard back from any of the companies in Dublin or the surrounding area like Meath and Wicklow about the cost of like fixer disposal, which is annoying. I thought they would have gotten back to me in the month since I emailed them all. Whatever, I'm not gonna name them. But for reference, the waste containers that I deal with in work, the aqueous water-based waste containers, which contain no heavy metals, cost about 25 euros per 10 liter drum to be taken away and disposed. But that's in bulk quantities of 150 to 300 containers. So in smaller quantities, the price would be higher than that. And then per liter, that still works out at a few euros per liter, plus the effort of going to actually get it done and maybe you have to do paperwork and pay you know, an additional admin fee or whatever. I don't know how these places work, but that's for non-heavy metal contaminated waste and you will pay even more than that for heavy metal contaminated waste. 
How much? I can't say. It's going to depend entirely on where you are in the world, but you're going to have to pay for it if you can't desilver the fixer yourself. And as I said, you should not pour this down the drain because it will wreck your home as well as possibly get you in severe legal trouble. For all of these reasons, used fixer gets a flat zero out of three for disposal. There are things out there that are more toxic and more harmful, like say the color developing agents CD3 and CD4 from color print developing, but they are used in much smaller, more dilute quantities than fixer. Think about how many people you know who print color photos in the dark room. I know one. I know hundreds of people who develop black and white film at home. So overall, fixer is a much more significant problem to the average darkroom enthusiast. And yeah, it's a flat zero from me. Fixer isn't that expensive and it goes quite a long way. It's also absolutely mandatory, so you know, whinging about the price doesn't help in any way. It's not like a stop bath where you could justify those few cents or too much for you. You have to fix your images, unless you become a solarization photographer. In which case, good for you. Fixer costs about 16 euros at the time of recording on the photoshop.ae for a one liter bottle of Ilford Rapid Fixer. Other fixers will probably cost somewhere in the same region, the same kind of price range per liter. That one liter can develop about 120 rolls of film, so it works out to about 13 to 14 cents per roll. That's not really a lot. So with the small amount of effort it takes to put it in a reasonably well stored bottle at a cool temperature, it helps because it just means you get more out of your bottle of fixer and have less, you know, fixer waste. Once there's any silver in there, it's heavy metal waste. You know, even if it's partially spent or completely exhausted, it still goes in heavy metal waste. Just helps you get a little bit more out of it so you don't have to pay as much for disposal long term, which is a good thing. However, that disposal could cost you an absolute bomb. I have no idea how much it's going to cost, but there are ways around it. So I wasn't sure whether to give it a one or a two, maybe one and a half. Again, I don't want to get into that kind of granular scoring. So I'll give it a two out of three. The fixer itself is not that expensive and it's pretty economical. And then there are ways to desilver it yourself at home to kind of save or completely eliminate that disposal cost. So yeah, I think two out of three is fair. If you're willing to put in the effort, you can save the, the cost of disposal. If you're not, one out of three, that's on you. Before I tally the scores up, I do as always need to give a huge thanks to the folks at the photoshop.ie who again have sponsored this video series and partnered with me to help educate people just a little bit and just make things a little bit safer and more comfortable, give people some peace of mind and better understanding of what it is they're really working with. Not only is their catalogue always growing, but they're really open to community feedback here in Dublin for example, they recently started stocking Fomapan 400 in 4x5 in response to demand from the consumers around here. A lot of places wouldn't do that, and that's really nice and impressive. I recently picked up my first packet of Extol from them, and I'll be making some content about that coming very soon because uh, after hearing Patrick rant about it for about two years now, I thought I would give it a try. And with some films, he has a point. And now to tally up the actual scores. For safety, Ilford Rapid Fixer got 2 out of 3. Handling, also 2 out of 3. Disposal, 0 out of 3. And cost, 2 out of 3 as well. For a total of 6 out of 12. The disposal is really the main thing that drags the score down here and it is something you need to be wary of. That will apply to any fixer, not just Ilford Rapid Fixer. So if we talk about more fixers in future, it'll be interesting to see how they compare in the other regards, because disposal is still going to be a huge problem. So I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful in some capacity. Uh, stay safe and bye bye for now. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at chaka1277 for new pictures every single day. If you like this video and enjoy what I do on the channel, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.